Thank you. Uh, I'm deeply honored to have been invited here today to speak about Mark Twain's personal recollections of Joan of Arc. For that honor, I must thank Joe Lamack and the Center for Mark Twain Studies here in Elmira, as well as Chris Longwell for making our stay at Quarry Farm so comfortable. I must also thank Susan McWilliams Barnt and Joseph Fulton. Susan, for suggesting that I apply for this wonderful program, and Professor Fulton for encouraging me, whether he intended to or not, to persist in my work on personal recollections of Joan of Arc. It's fitting that this novel should be my subject today. Here in Elmira, I'm surrounded by monuments to the struggle for justice, equality, and autonomy for women. This is, after all, the city of the Free Academy, right? A co-educational and integrated school established in the middle of the 19th century, as well as the Elmira Industrial School, trade school founded uh, in 1878, run by women for women. In Elmira College, we have the first institution of higher education in America to grant degrees to women that were equivalent to those granted to the men. And then there's Park Church itself, home to the first ordained female minister in New York and the person who Twain chose to deliver his eulogy Annis Ford Eastman. Well, what is personal recollections, if not Twain's most glowing account of the power of human nature in female form? Its heroine, a young shepherdess, who having received no formal education, illiterate by all accounts, and totally unschooled in the arts of war and statecraft, delivers her country from its English fetters. And for all of her success in fields thought proper for men only, but where no French man had succeeded in generations, what does Joan win for herself but a trial, conviction, and execution at the hands of her male captors? As a testament to female excellence and the injustices to which such excellence is often subject, it's not surprising that Twain should dedicate this novel, the one he called his best and the object of his greatest efforts to Livy his beloved wife and partner in securing women's rights in this country. But I want to problematize this claim that Twain makes about personal recollections, if only to support it, because it's, it's quite the claim, right, that this novel should be the best work composed by this giant of American letters. Indeed, many of his most informed 20th century readers, among whom we must count uh, Louis J. Budd, Bernard DeVoto, James Geismar, James Cox, and Susan Harris, among others, have either savaged this novel or dismissed it. This is partly because of what we know about Twain's corpus. In his last finished novel, Twain appears to eschew his trademark comedy in lieu of a tragic history. Instead of impish American boys in search of adventures or playing pranks on others, Twain gives us a girl, and a French one at that, who appears modest, well-mannered, patriotic, and devoutly Catholic. Instead of the biting satire and anti-clerical fury for which he was known, Twain here makes a saint his subject, and he treats seriously Joan's claim to divine authority, dedicates over a third of his longest novel to the intricacies of a Catholic church trial. Moreover, while it's true that his heroine comes from humble stock and expresses no wish to join the elite of French society, Joan's political commitments are decidedly elitist. She appears to defend the institution of French monarchy, to support the religious principle justifying its patriarchy, and as a reward for her efforts on behalf of Charles VII, she requests for her hometown a tax-exempt status that no other French village enjoyed. All of these are strikingly out of tune with the strident defenses of equality and secular democracy expressed by Twain throughout much of his life and by so many of his characters throughout his corpus. Finally, while Twain's more popular works tend to end on a happier note, with his embattled protagonist getting saved, in many cases at the last minute, and uh, uh, almost always involving a twist that borders on a deus ex machina, this last largely forgotten novel draws out Joan's inevitable conviction 
and her fiery execution. There is little within the narrative to shock, surprise, or even delight the reader. For reasons like these, fans of Twain's humor found his narrative boring. Of all the sins laid at the feet of personal recollections, this one is perhaps the most unforgivable. But I offer a way to account for this novel's apparent strangeness while respecting Twain's seemingly outsized assessment of it. And I do so not by situating the novel within Twain's efforts on behalf of women's rights. I do so by tending to the work's engagement with the questions, texts, and figures at the heart of political philosophy in the West for the last three millennia. My comments will thus proceed along four lines, four steps. First, a brief introduction to the novel and the story it tells. Then some background on Twain's experience with political philosophy. Third, an encapsulation of my argument about Twain's Joan of Arc. And then finally, the textual evidence for reading Twain's Joan as a Machiavellian princess avant la lettre. First then, some background on a novel that, of all of Twain's work, seems to receive the least amount of attention. A show of hands here, who has actually read Personal Recollections? All right, we've got three. Impressive. Very good. Good for you guys. Well, for those of you who haven't read it, uh, an abridged version of Personal Recollections was first serialized in Harper's Magazine in 1895, anonymously and then published under Twain's name the following year. And to his longest novel, he fittingly gave his longest title. <sighs> this is the title. Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by the Sieur Louis de Camp, her page and secretary, freely translated out of the ancient French into modern English from the original unpublished manuscript in the National Archives of France by Jean-Francois Alden. As a, you know, like stop for a, a sandwich in the middle of that. As for the novel itself, it recounts in three books the story of Joan of Arc's life and military career from the perspective of the fictive Sir Louis de Caen, one of jo Joan's childhood friends and her secretary during her military campaigns. The first eight chapters. The first eight chapters are dedicated to Joan's childhood and the Archangel Michael's revelation of her divine mission to save France. The second book in the novel, all of 41 chapters, addresses Joan's military career, detailing her meteoric rise from shepherdess to general of the armies of France, covering her victories at Orléans and Pâté, the bloodless march to Reims, and the coronation of the king, ending with her capture outside Compiègne. The third book focuses on Joan's imprisonment, trial, and execution by the Catholic Church under the approving eye of the English army. So at first glance, then, this book appears to be an attempt at historical hagiography. But this appearance is belied by its engagement with political philosophy. That Twain's literary fiction uh, was concerned with politics is beyond question. The titles and themes of some of his more famous works make that political focus evident. What is less appreciated is the extent to which Twain himself engaged and was familiar with works of political philosophy. Now, a, a full review of Twain's corpus exceeds my comments today, but a few examples here will suffice to make my point. So, for instance, according to Joe Fulton, the young Twain copied portions of three of Voltaire's dialogues into his notebooks, sometimes using them as a starting point for his own literary creativity. Throughout his career, Twain not only borrowed imagery and quotations from Shakespeare's plays, he also published a lengthy essay on the question of the authorship of the Bard's dramas, a, a book which had as much to do with Francis Bacon and himself as it did with Shakespeare. His medieval romance, The Prince and the Pauper, which explicitly draws on David Hume's multi-volume history of England, opens with a passage from The Merchant of Venice. He used Edmund Burke's famous case against Warren Hastings to campaign against Richard Croker for mayor of New York City, and he borrowed from Burke's reflections on the revolution in France for his description, or one of his descriptions, of Joan of Arc. 
Twain was also familiar with Machiavelli, having owned and annotated a copy of Pasquale Villari's The Life and Times of Niccolo Machiavelli, published in 1892, the second volume of which provides a sustained treatment of Machiavelli's discourses and The Prince, with many passages from both works quoted in full. So Twain, even if he hadn't read the originals, would have been exposed to a serious outline of the arguments of both texts. Twain also demonstrated a continued fascination with Cervantes' Don Quixote. And we see this in his preference for the form of historical romance, such as you find it in Huck Finn, Personal Recollections, Prince and the Pauper, Number 44, The Mysterious Stranger, Connecticut Yankee. In fact, in this latter work, Twain evinces familiarity with the full range of modern political philosophy. So in his political, commercial, and scientific orientation, Twain's Yankee, right, Hank Morgan, bears the unmistakable imprint of Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Montesquieu, and Francis Bacon. When he turns to the sweeter sentiments of family life or celebrates revolutionary politics, one detects the fingerprints of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And both his nihilism and the novel's concluding Holocaust, one finds the influence of Friedrich Nietzsche, whom Twain famously claimed to have never read, though his secretary did read Nietzsche to him. As for Twain's familiarity with classical political thought, well, Twain not only enjoyed uh, reading aloud the dialogues of Plato, but was intimately familiar with the histories of Herodotus, Thucydides, Tacitus, Suetonius, and Caesar, the poetry of, of Ovid, Horace, Catullus, Tibullus, the epigrams of Marshall, the works of Cicero, Epictetus, and Plutarch, to say nothing of numerous secondary works on ancient Greek and Rome. As for the impact of classical antiquity on his own work, the similarities between, say, Huck Finn's American Odyssey and Homer's original have drawn more than a little notice. In fact, Twain, in an unpublished essay written the same year he finished Huckleberry Finn, purports to be writing a review of a, quote, new German book entitled De Odyssey by an uh, inexperienced first-time author, Herr Homer. There is also, and perhaps more obviously, the 100-page dialogue, What is Man? A text that reflects Twain's facility with the dialogic genre made famous by Plato and evidences, I mean, massively evidences, uh, Twain's having read The Republic, Plato's Republic, evidence which can also be found in his use of the allegory of the cave in Connecticut Yankee, the secret myth of Oedipus, personal recollections of Joan of Arc, and so on. So Twain gives us ample reason to approach his career as one that speaks to and has long been informed by political philosophy, the questions that drive it and the works that engage in it. This is equally true of his work on Joan. For instance, both Wilson Carey McWilliams and David Foster note that in Connecticut Yankee and Personal Recollections, Twain set himself the task of exploring the divine right of kings behind which lies the much larger question of whether a providential deity exists who intervenes in political affairs of men to ensure divine justice. Through this particular thematic link, the inquiry into the status of a providential deity, Twain situates two of his final novels, one of which he considered his best, amidst the many works in the tradition of Western political thought that address the theological political problem. Now, if as I claim, the effort to unlock the riddle of Joan demands a reading sensitive to the political dimensions of the novel, then what does a political reading, such as I propose, show? Well, personal recollections of Joan of Arc is no hagiography nor is it some cheap historical recitation of Joan's words and deeds. This Joan is also, and I'm sorry to say in the present uh, company, not the avatar of Protestant Reformation, nor is she the vehicle for some lowbrow attack on Catholicism, whose respectful treatment in this novel finds no equal in Twain's professional career. And yet this Joan is also not the illiterate and ignorant peasant girl who comes to command such dizzying heights through the assistance from her heavenly host. No, no, no. A careful reading of the novels, such as Twain trains his readers to undertake, will cast doubt 
on Joan receiving assistance from the heavenly voices. Though she has no qualms with making such claims in her own name, or allowing, in some cases, even inspiring and prompting others to make such statements on her behalf. So this Joan is cut from a much different cloth than the historical maid. The Joan of Arc that Twain gives us here is a genius, a prodigy, possessed with immense natural gifts. She's an intellectual acuity that allows her to adopt almost effortlessly skills wholly foreign to her or people of her station. Her foresight and prudence allows this untaught peasant girl to navigate ambushes set for her by the experienced generals, statesmen, and theologians of Europe, and to do it with such grace and ease as to make her in, appear inspired by God. She thus draws comparison to Alexander the Great and Napoleon Bonaparte in the acquisition and disposition of her forces. She is as capable of laying traps that will ensnare and destroy her enemies as she is in sniffing out those laid for her. More importantly, Joan's political and military leadership are informed by her marvelous study of human nature. Her uncanny powers of discernment allow her to read and understand the passions that inspire men and women to perform great acts of sacrificial devotion, powers that then allow her to shape the minds and souls of men to serve her political goals for France. It's in the service of these goals that Joan undermines the old modes and orders of the French state and prepares the way for a secular humanism that will define modernity. So wielding power and influence like the almighty Joan heralds death to English rule in France and gives life to the long dead French nation, a nation that now, under Joan's influence, will stand on its own two legs freed from a debilitating dependency on the Catholic Church. Read this way, personal recollection presents Joan of Arc as the foundress of modern France, and by virtue of that, in Twain's treatment, the very foundress of modernity in the West. Now, I grant that this may seem like hyperbole to many, and yet, incredibly, there's even more. For in Twain's artful presentation, Joan of Arc rises above the plane of political action to the level of speech itself. The story of her life is itself an argument that Twain uses to serve his interests. Twain invents for us a heroine whose appeal to her followers calls forth those moral and political opinions that support and demand the divine right of kings and which in doing so reveals their weaknesses for some in Twain's audience to see. Indeed, despite her outward shows of piety and her deference to customary authority, performances that I think are largely intended for the consumption of her numerous audiences, Joan is a radical iconoclast whose military and political successes challenge the sharp distinctions long thought to characterize the moral, material, and religious categories of the medieval world. By defying these categories, Joan's example, that is, Twain's Joan, calls into question a view of the cosmos that insists upon a fixed order that is rationally intelligible to the unaided human mind. Calling such a cosmic view into question is significant insofar as such a view of the cosmos, namely that it be rationally intelligible to us human beings, is a precondition for the mechanistic determinism that's frequently associated with Twain's morally pessimistic view of man and the universe, and which Twain often links to the birth of modernity. And that rational view of the cosmos is also, as Twain shows us, a precondition for the moral perspective behind the belief in the divine right of kings. By highlighting for the reader both the limitations of this demand for rational intelligibility and the significance of those limitations for our opinions about the moral and material and political and spiritual worlds we inhabit, Twain points his readers to the difficulties bound to face those ways of life that implicitly pursue a wholeness that in his view is impossible to achieve. By doing so, Twain's artistry liberates us from those moral, political, religious, and even philosophic opinions that demand the kind of coherence and intelligibility that will always elude humanity's grasp. 
Because it calls into question the freedoms associated with both the medieval and modern worlds, personal, personal recollections invites us to consider conceptions of freedom and conceptions of human flourishing that belong to a different register, a pre-modern, even a pre-Christian register. Of course, among those so liberated, we would have to include Twain himself. And in view of that liberation, the claims about Twain's moral outrage and cynicism, predicated as they are on the existence of such an intelligible world, begin to lose their traction. Now, thus far, I have spoken elusively about the novel. My time, and perhaps your interest, prevent a more detailed discussion of the many provocative claims I've just made. So in the time that remains, I will focus on my claim that Twain's portrait of Joan is the product of his engagement with the text, questions, and figures at the heart of political philosophy in the West. There are, to my reading, five political philosophers whose influence can be detected in personal recollections. St. Thomas Aquinas, Plato, Xenophon, Miguel Cervantes, and Niccolo Machiavelli. One can detect Thomas in Book Three's presentation of the scholastic reasoning employed by the Catholic Church to prosecute Joan for her cross-dressing. Images drawn from Plato's Republic, Symposium, and Apology are scattered throughout the book. And in his title, narrative structure, and even theme, one sees parallels too striking to dismiss both to Cervantes' Don Quixote and to Xenophon's memorabilia of Socrates. Then there's Machiavelli. It's his work that looms largest in personal recollections, and it's his presence in the novel that I want to focus on. Niccolo Machiavelli, the 16th century Florentine diplomat, statesman, dramatist, and political philosopher, is credited primarily for two things, being the founder of modernity and for openly teaching people how to be bad. Even if people haven't read The Prince, they know that it teaches people that it's better to be feared than loved, that there is such a thing as cruelty well used, that deceit and avarice are virtues if they help a prince succeed, and so on. Machiavellianism is thus synonymous with the exercise of unprincipled cunning. Naturally, Machiavelli, Machiavelli's modernness and his open badness are linked. Let's start with the first thing, origins of modernity. Personal recollections is suffused with images and language meant to herald the dawning of a modern, secular, and technological age. Louis de Camp opens his tale with an account of a veritable state of nature, as the civil wars between the Armagnacs and Burgundians subjected Paris to the depredations of unrestrained mobs who were nightly sacking, burning, killing, unmolested, uninterrupted. Between that violence and the famine, pestilence, and the biggest winter in 500 years, Parisian corpses piled so high that wolves entered the city in daylight and devoured them. From this Hobbesian anarchic beginning in which men are indistinguishable from beasts, the novel concludes with a nation unified under one king, at peace, and freed from English domination. It's translator singing a paean to the greatness of Joan's patriotism. In between, the novel portrays the formation of a new social contract, one centered around Joan and whose true authority derives from her understanding of human nature and her incredible natural, natural, not God-given talents. The impression that the novel charts the origins of modernity is further reinforced by the timing of Louis de Conte's dictation. Set in 1492, these memoirs introduce us to Joan the same year that Columbus discovered the New World, a feat that signals man's mastery over nature, inaugurates an age of exploration and colonialism, and ultimately makes possible America, a nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal and endowed with inalienable rights that throne and altar must respect. Then there's Decant's prefatory letter to his great 
great-grandnephews and nieces. Here, DeCant refers to the advent of the printing press and thus to the innovation that makes possible the dissemination of knowledge to all people, subsequently leveling the distinctions between the literate clergy and aristocracy on the one hand and the unlettered peasants on the other. One is thus not surprised to discover the rise of egalitarian sentiments in the novel, whether we see it in the stated preference of the paladin, uh, one of Joan's childhood friends who joins her in her, her marches, uh, his preference for individual merit over ancestral authority, or in the heart of that pious, superstitious, and cynical aristocrat, Louis de Con. And an aside to the nephew copying his memoir, de Kant, having reflected a little bit on Joan's father, remarks, I do believe that someday it will be found that peasants are people. Yes, beings in a great many respects like ourselves. And I believe someday that they will find this out too. And then, well, then I think they will rise and demand to be regarded as part of the race. And that by consequence, there will be trouble. The allusion here to the French Revolution some three centuries hence reminds the reader of the crushing blow to the throne and altar whose seeds Joan here has sowed. Now Joan succeeds in crippling the English occupation of France and in laying the foundations for a new world to come because she embodies many of the brutal lessons counseled in Machiavelli's Prince. We see, for instance, that Joan is able to transform the French forces, who've known nothing but defeat for the better part of a century, into a savage army whose taste for bloodshed scarcely respects the laws of war or humanity. That the men who fought under the Maid of Orléans could be reduced to such brutish behavior might surprise us. That is, until we recollect that their leader, despite her public acts of pi piety and humanity, proves every bit the paragon of Machiavellian cunning and cruelty. For starters, Joan, at an early age, and I'm talking like seven years old, articulated a view of necessity that rules out moral agency and reduces men to their most beast-like passions. Later, to secure her military and political goals, the presumably faithful Joan is willing to lie both to her uncle Laxart and to an enemy captain, and to disobey both her father and her king. When initially confronted with her deceptions, Joan could not completely accept the justifications offered by her men, namely that in the perils and necessities of war, uh, uh, in the perils and necessities of war, deceptions that help one's own cause and hurt the enemies were always permissible. And yet, while she couldn't deny that she violated an ethical command in deceiving as she did, she also concludes that the thing itself was right and I'd do it again. Despite her apparent moral qualms, Joan's statements here offer little more than raison d'etat, the same kind of rationale that would later inform her outward disobedience to King Charles VII in the name of French freedom. True to form, her narrator moralizes Joan's actions here, deducing that Joan would sacrifice herself and her best self, that is her truthfulness to save her cause. But only that, she would not buy her life at that cost. Her deception thus contained a principle which lifted it above the commonplace and made it great and fine. Now let's face it, if there's any principle at work in this instance, it's an inversion of Mark chapter eight, verse 36 where Christ tells his followers, for what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Joan, it seems, is willing to sacrifice her best self in order to gain the world. That is France. Then there's Joan's posture towards violence. Despite her reputed distaste for bloodshed, Joan does not appear shy about having it spilled at her command. So she actually threatens to behead Jean Donois, who's a, the bastard of Orléans, right? One of her own officers, should he fail to provide timely notification of enemy troop movements. This is neither an idle threat nor something that she uttered only once, despite what our, our hyper-pious narrator says here. Early in the novel, a very young Joan wishes for the beheading of a Burgundian priest who dared suggest 
that the French should obey the Treaty of Troyes, which acknowledged that Henry V, the English king, was the rightful inheritor of the French throne. She also urges her own king to hang those who are traitorous to him. She's willing to fight on a holy day, the Feast uh, uh, of the Ascension. And while Twain never shows her putting another man to the sword, Joan seems responsible for the death of at least one of her first turncoats. Finally, when Joan no longer has an excuse to return to battle, her thoughts and temperament continually draw her back towards bloody business, despite her loud protestations to the contrary. Thus, having raised the siege of Orléans and crowned the king at Reims, deeds which satisfy and therefore discharge the task set by God originally, right? That's what she was tasked to do, those two things. She took care of it. So what? Joe can now at long last return to her village and the womanly occupations of needlework and tending to her animals. So what does she do with her newfound freedom? Almost immediately, she starts teaching her father swordplay and wishing she could go back to the wars because, you know, the new ribbons her mother sent her would help her fight better. And she gets reinstated at the head of the armies of France without raising a single objection on her behalf. And during the subsequent eight months uh, that, that she and her staff traveled from castle to castle in the company of the king, Joan refrained from the festivities of courtly life, instead choosing to spend her time planning now forever unrealizable military combinations for entertainment. It was her only game, her only relief from her burden of sorrow and inaction. She played it hour after hour, as others play chess, and lost herself in it too, and so got repose for her mind and healing for her heart. As someone for whom plotting the destruction of others is a game, a relief from sorrow, healing for her mind and heart, Joan appears less a saint and more a monster. After her capture at Compiègne, having been imprisoned, liberated from the miseries of battle, does the mild and saintly Joan take this hiatus from her bloody work to turn to her prayers and express relief at being removed from the grisly business of war? Nope. She tries to escape from her captors twice and at great risk to her life so she can return to her armies. And it appears Joan does all of this because she embodies a new mode of fighting as Lahire, her most ardent defender among the general staff, reminds her doubters. Responding, responding to those captains of hers who counsel a timid approach to warfare, Lahire delivers a fiery defense of jo Joan's new science of warfare, one that bears quoting nearly in full. Men, there's a new state of things, and a surpassing military genius has perceived it with her clear eye, and a new road is required. And that same clear eye has noted where it must go and has marked it out for us. The man does not live, never has lived, never will live that can improve upon it. The new case is this. Men all on fire with pluck and dash and vim and fury and energy, a restrained conflagration. Nothing shows the splendor and wisdom of her military genius like her instant comprehension of the size of the change which has come about and her instant perception of the right and only right way to, right way to take advantage of it. With her, it is no sitting down and starving out. No, it is storm, 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 and still storm, 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 and forever storm, storm, storm. Hunt the enemy to his hole, then turn the French hurricanes loose and carry him by storm. Lahire here celebrates an extreme love of force, a love which might seem laudatory when in the service of French patriotism, but whose apparent limitlessness raises more doubts about the moral character of Joan's ambitions. Her approach to war is new and distinctive because like the tempest it's compared to, it's directionless in its destruction. It doesn't recognize any limit, moral, spiritual, even political on excesses outside of her own will. In fact, it seems it's only Joan's will that could restrain such a conflagration. But what is the massive change that Joan has perceived, which recommends this limitless storming as the only way to take advantage of it? In the chapter immediately following Lahire's celebration of Joan's tempestuous spirit, Twain gives us a hint. There, his narrator relates, relates the siege of Jargot. A siege where, for the first time in the novel, he discusses the use of that deadly novelty, artillery. 
De Kant reports that in between the English fortifications of Jargot and Joan's French army lay the suburbs of the city. Caught in the ensuing crossfire, the poor little town around us suffered cruelty, cruelly, cannonballs tearing through its slight buildings, wrecking them as if they had been built of cards. And every moment, one or two, uh, or two, one would see a huge rock come curving through the upper air above the smoke clouds and go plunging down through the roofs. The danger to the suburbs could be clearly anticipated. But Joan never instructs the inhabitants of the town to evacuate. Indeed, though she urges her own captain, D'Alencon, to avoid cannon fire, she expresses no such concern for the town civilians. Now, just before the assault on the fortifications, de Kant draws our attention to three scenes of domestic tranquility. There's a man about to hammer something to the doorpost of his shop. There's a boy whose rolling hoop escapes his guidance and does its own steering. And then there's a pretty girl about to water her red flowers in a window frame. De Kant notes that in the ensuing artillery exchange, the young girl was killed, a stone cannonball crashing through her fair body. What happened to the boy and the man, De Kant doesn't say. But it's surely more than a coincidence that Twain, on the precipice of a battle that emphasizes the power of modern artillery, should also have his narrator draw our attention to images that evoke Martin Luther's 95 Theses, an orbit that moves under its own control, and angelic innocence. In the assault on Jargot with the thundering and clouds produced by cannon fire, Twain intimates that Joan's perpetual storming cannot be understood by reference to her military tactics alone. No, her storming heralds the advent of a new world, one that anticipates the freedom of the individual from the authority of the church, from a cosmos directed by a guiding hand, and from a virginal purity that proves fatal to its practitioners. De Kant himself alerts us to the significance of this transition when he notes here that the stillness before the battle was, quote, something awful because it meant so much, unquote. The old world you see has come to a halt. The new world will be set in motion by the thunder and violence of Joan's cannons and built upon the smoldering ashes of medieval pastoralism. Now, the massive change that Joan now comprehends, to which Lahire referred earlier, is the vulnerability of the old world she seeks to replace. She senses that the medieval world can be stamped out if one can muster the energy and the will to level it completely. Of course, Lahire overstates Joan's addiction to storming, but only by a little. I mean, she was remarkably patient and remarkably cunning. But that just means that Joan embodies the prudence and violence that Machiavelli, in the images of the fox and lion, would urge his princes to imitate in the 16th century. Indeed, Twain's Joan seems to precede Machiavelli's lessons at every step. So let's take a moment to consider here the ways both overtly and indirectly that Twain's Joan manifests Machiavelli's famous counsel in his famous prince. And we've already noted that Joan embodies the prudence of the fox and the force of the lion. And given her ability to cultivate a reputation for piety, self-sacrifice, and humility, Joan has also mastered the appearance of being, quote, merciful, faithful, humane, honest, and religious, while retaining the ability to, quote, change to the contrary, as circumstances dictate. As far as, uh, as whether it's better to be feared or loved, Joan's actually both having captured Machiavelli's first, if oft forgotten, preference in this respect, that if possible, one would want to be both one and the other. Like the counsel Machiavelli seeks to impart to Lorenzo de' Medici in the epistle dedicatory, Joan appears to possess the knowledge of princes, because she's of the people, and she possesses knowledge of the people, making her a kind of prince. Like Machiavelli's Moses, Joan appears to enjoy, enjoy divine favor, but builds the foundation of the future French state on bloodshed and terror. And while she appears an unarmed prophetess, like the Savonarola whom Machiavelli deplores, she is backed by the armed might of France, whose soldiers follow her in the belief that God chose her to deliver them their freedom. In fact, Joan, who outside of her own wits possesses no arms of her own, gradually acquires many arms for herself, whether it be the axe from Theophile Benoit, 
the troops of Robert Beaudricourt, the sword of Charlemagne, or the armies of Charles VII, and she puts them all to her use. She thus recalls Machiavelli's David, who, in the Florentine's twisted retelling of Scripture, assumes for himself the arms of his enemy that he then uses against the Philistine. And insofar as the village madman, the governor of Vaucouleur, the holy sword of France, and its king, her soldiers, and even her childhood friend, Sir Louis de Conte, insofar as they all become her factors, Joan resembles Pope Alexander VI, who in The Prince uses his famous son, Cesare Borgia, and his son's captains to affect his political aims in Italy. Given such craftiness, Joan is that kind of secretary to Charles VII who happens to possess, in Machiavelli's classification, the first kind of brain, that is, the one that understands by itself, making Charles VII the second, or maybe even the third kind of brain. Just so you know, Machiavelli's third brain is useless, he says. It's useless. That's fitting for Charles VII. Of course, as Machiavelli points out, any prince who is not wise by himself cannot be counseled well, since those who are wise by themselves will soon deprive him of his state. But guess what? This is precisely how Twain concludes the novel, with Joan's authority supplanting the authority both of Charles VII and God Almighty for the true authority in the world she's created. Everything I've said thus far about Jones' Machiavellianism has been called from books one and books two, right? And and this this isn't even the half of it. Book three, we've seen the same traits at work there, right? Book three details her imprisonment, trial, and execution. So seeing the same traits there suggests that Joan has deliberately engineered her martyrdom in order to extenuate her glory and perpetuate her modern political project. Now, for the the three of you who are are familiar with the novel, I grant that this reading will strike you as strange. It certainly differs from many other scholarly readings of personal recollections. But I think it's justified in part by the textual evidence I've supplied. And I think it's justified further because such an approach helps us understand why Twain thought this novel could be his best. For in showing how a Machiavellian princess like Joan can effectively manipulate religious believers like her friend and narrator, Louis de Conte, or her numerous Catholic countrymen in the name of creating a modern, egalitarian, secular world, Twain answers the crucial question of how the modern world could come into existence. For if Connecticut Yankee dramatizes the near total antipathy between the the, the, the Yankee secular and technological democracy and the moral and the religious world of the Arthurians that he seeks to destroy, then personal recollection shows how the former world view could actually evolve out of the latter. Read this way, personal recollection represents a kind of completion of an intellectual inquiry into the origins of modernity that was the focus of so much of Twain's personal historical reading and research. I mean, pick up Lecky, pick up Carlyle, pick up Macaulay. You'll see this is, uh, this is at the heart of so much of their historical work. And it also turns out to be the focus of so much of, of Twain's uh, um, subjects in his novels, right? Prince and the Pauper, Connecticut Yankee, and believe it or not, even Puddinhead Wilson fits into this scheme. Of course, none of this means that Twain approves of Machiavelli or the world that he and his followers helped produce. We learn as much from Twain's tribute to William Dean Howells, published in 1906. There, yeah, there we go. (laughs) There Twain quotes the following passage from Howells' review of a recent book on Machiavelli by Lewis Dyer. Quote, he, Dyer, thinks that Machiavelli was in earnest as none but an idealist can be. And he is the first to imagine him an idealist immersed in realities, who involuntarily transmutes the events under his eye into something like the visionary issues of reverie, unquote. In the only place I know where Twain publicly mentions Machiavelli, he deliberately highlights the view that the father of modern realism was in fact an idealist, one who advanced his Republican teachings in the name of a new kind of dreamy reverie. But precisely because his schemes were rooted in dreams more than reality, Machiavelli could be subject to the same criticisms of all those like Twain's Joan who pursued utopian schemes 
in the face of certain practical limitations. For the reader of personal recollections, these limitations point us back to that older conception of freedom and human, human flourishing that, to, that are hinted at in his references to Plato and Xenophon found throughout his novel, and which begin by taking seriously, as Twain surely did here and elsewhere, the human soul's enduring concern for justice. Thank you. <laughs>